When we think of the richest families in the world, we think of people like the Walton family and the Saudi royal family. And though they do have enormous amounts of wealth, they're not exactly 100% family businesses today. Walmart is a public company and half of the company is owned by investors. Meanwhile, the Saudi royal family is more of a dictatorship than a family business. There is $100 billion conglomerate though that is still almost completely owned by the founding family. And that is of course the infamous Koch brothers. Today, the two richest Koch heirs themselves are worth $122.6 billion. So here's how the Koch brothers ended up owning the world's richest private family business. It all started on September 23, 1900 when Fred Chase Koch was born in Quanah, Texas. Fred's father, Harry Koch, was a Dutch immigrant who originally worked as a printer's apprentice back in the Netherlands. Harry had immigrated to the US with the American Dream and he bought the Tribune Chief newspaper after he arrived in America. This provided the family with a decent living, but nothing too crazy. Fred would end up attending Rice University in 1917, where he spent two years before transferring to MIT. Fred finished up his chemical engineering degree at MIT in 1922 and instantly jumped into the workforce. Fred scored a job at Texaco, probably as a chemical engineer. He jumped around from job to job, working up the corporate ladder with each switch. Within a few years, Fred had secured a job as chief engineer at the Medway Oil and Storage Company. Though this was likely a super nice gig, Fred wasn't quite satisfied. He wanted to follow in his father's footsteps and start his own company. So in 1925, he reached out to a classmate from MIT named Keith Winkler, who had started his own company called Keith Winkler Engineering Company. Keith eventually quit the business and the company would be left to Fred. Being an extremely small player within the oil industry, Fred had to think of some creative solutions to efficiently compete against the big players. Fred's first step in this direction was developing a more efficient thermal cracking process, which allowed small refineries to turn crude oil into gasoline. Larger oil companies quickly caught sight of this invention and decided to crush Fred with litigation. They launched 44 lawsuits against Fred, which of course drowned him for many years. Given that most of these lawsuits were utter BS designed to simply push out Fred from the business, Fred ended up winning basically every single lawsuit. Fred won 43 out of the 44 lawsuits filed against him, and it was eventually discovered that the lawsuit he lost was due to a bribed judge. So really, he won every single one of them. Nonetheless, as Fred dealt with the litigation, it was extremely difficult for him to conduct business in the US. So he took his invention to the Soviet Union. At first, Fred was extremely cautious when it came to the Soviets as he was worried that they wouldn't pay him. So Fred demanded that he be paid up front and the Soviets agreed. In 1929, Fred started working with Soviet officials to set up 15 oil refineries. He also trained Bolshevik engineers to operate and run these refineries. For many years, it seemed like the partnership was progressing phenomenally. Fred had earned about $500,000. But once the Soviets got a hang of things, they decided to cut out Fred. Stalin started taking out Koch employees, which quickly pushed Fred out of the Soviet Union, regretting the collaboration altogether. Back at home, Fred was still handling the onslaught of lawsuits, so he looked for other international opportunities and he would land on Germany. Germany was being led by some crazy people with crazy beliefs, but there was no denying that the country was progressing rapidly, so Fred took the opportunity. Fred ended up building a massive refinery in Hamburg, which was personally approved by Hitler himself. The Koch family has since tried to cover up this part of his story for obvious reasons. But the high frequency of Fred's visits to Germany suggests that Germany was indeed a major part of his business during the 1930s. Fun fact, rumors suggest that Fred almost boarded the Hindenburg during one of his trips to Germany. But a scheduling delay saved him from the accident. By the end of the 1930s, Fred finished up with his commitments to Germany and things were looking better than ever before. Fred had become quite wealthy from his business in the Soviet Union and Germany and he was able to form international connections. In the meantime, the 44 lawsuits were finally winding down after 15 years. And these turned out to be a good thing as well as Fred ended up winning $1.5 million through the lawsuits. Ironically, that's three times the amount he was paid by Stalin. With all of this money, connections, and experience, Fred was finally able to turn his attention onto the American market in 1941 with the founding of Koch Engineering Company. The next 20 years were pretty much smooth sailing for Fred. Having worked with Stalin and Hitler and having defended himself from the oil giants, actually growing an oil company in America wasn't that difficult for Fred. He made a plethora of partnerships, acquisitions, and deals. And soon enough, Fred became a multi-decamillionaire businessman by the 1960s. 
and this is when he would face his last major challenge, which was figuring out what to do with his business after his death. Fred had four sons and was hoping that as they grew up, they would develop an interest in the family business. But this wasn't the case. While his children did care about preserving the family wealth, none of his children really cared about running the business itself. This was especially true with his oldest son, Fred Koch Jr. Fred Jr. attended Harvard, but he got a humanities degree which was not very applicable to the family business. Moreover, Fred Jr. joined the US Navy after graduation, so Fred Jr. wasn't really a choice. As a result, Fred ended up choosing his most educated son, Charles. Charles had also attended MIT like Fred, and he had a bachelor's in general engineering and a dual master's in nuclear and chemical engineering. Despite being well qualified to run the business, Charles also wasn't interested in taking over the family business. It wasn't until Fred made an ultimatum that he was going to sell the company if Charles didn't take over that Charles joined the company. Charles joined the company in 1961, and it was pretty good timing as Fred passed away just six years later in 1967 due to a heart attack. Charles would of course become the new CEO and chairman of the company. A couple of years later, Charles' brother David would also join the company as a technical services manager. David also had a bachelor's and a master's in chemical engineering from MIT, so he fit right in. David would eventually end up opening a new office in New York and become the president of one of the company's divisions. At this point, Charles had done most of the heavy lifting when it came to actually running and growing the business after his father's death, and David was the second most involved. Bill didn't join the company until 1974, but he would stir up the pot quite heavily. Bill had also gone to MIT, and not only did he have a bachelor's and a master's, but also a doctoral degree in chemical engineering. So you would think that he would fit right in, but this wasn't the case. According to Charles, Bill wanted higher level positions, but the divisions that Bill ran were usually not as profitable. So it didn't make sense to promote him up the corporate ladder. Bill also had a massive problem with how Charles was spending the company's money. Charles was, and still is, a super capitalist and despises socialist ideas. His father had gotten screwed over by Stalin, so Charles felt that nothing good could come out of socialistic programs like social security, minimum wage requirements, and welfare. Charles had been spending large amounts of money funding libertarian presidential candidates who upheld these beliefs. Bill hated this, and these tensions would blow over in Christmas of 1979, when Bill ignited a flame at the family get-together. Bill suggested that just because Charles had grown the company, doesn't mean that the other brothers don't have a right to decide the future of the company. At this point, their mother was still alive, and she was technically the one who owned the company. So Bill asked their mother how she was going to split up the company. Their mother started crying that it had come down to this and left the dinner table. And this was the last Christmas the Cokes spent together. Bill went ahead and got some other board members on his side along with their other brother, Fred Jr. Ironically, the two brothers who had done the least for the company were trying to take over the company. Bill organized a coup to fire Charles and take over, but fortunately for Charles, he would have just barely enough votes to keep him in power. Though Bill's coup had failed, it was clear how big of a threat he was. So Charles decided to give Bill what he wanted and move on. Both Bill and Charles called in a bunch of financial institutions like Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs to value Coke Industries. On June 4, 1983, Charles arranged for a buyout of Bill and Fred Jr.'s takes in the business. Bill was given $470 million and Fred Jr. was given $330 million. Charles hoped that this would finally bring peace to Coke Industries, but the peace was short-lived. Just a few years later, Bill started to complain that he was underpaid for his stake in the business and started filing a bunch of lawsuits against Coke Industries. Bill pursued these lawsuits up until the late 1990s and he did get a little bit more money. But eventually, Bill did give in. Bill walked away with a great amount of money, but he destroyed his relationship with Charles and David, and just sticking around would have resulted in way more money. But this is the path Bill chose. In the meantime, Charles owned 42% of the company, and David owned another 42%. The final 16% was owned by one of their father's friends, Howard Marshall II. Today, Coke Industries has roughly 100,000 employees and pulls in $115 billion in revenue annually. To put that into perspective, that's $30 billion more than Facebook. So it's not surprising that both David and Charles' fortunes are each worth $62 billion. Unfortunately, David died about two years ago due to prostate cancer, and his wealth is now managed by his wife Julia. Charles, on the other hand, is still alive at 85 years old, and he is still the CEO and chairman of Coke Industries. And that's the story of the world's richest family business. Do you guys think Bill's fight was justified? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you think Fred Sr. was a boss. 
And of course, consider joining our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari and I'll see you guys on the next one.